our lab is basically mostly interested in uh, interactions of viruses in the, and uh, the innate immune system. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, the world of viruses is very broad and there are many different viruses. And these viruses can have uh, different shapes. They would have uh, they bind to different receptors on the, on the cell surface. They activate a variety of different signaling pathways. And also they would contain different uh, information or different types of information. Some viruses have RNA uh, genomes and others have DNA genomes. And yet, or despite all this bombardment of all these microorganisms at a given time, we stay quite healthy. And one reason why this is the case is that there is an innate immune system in place that would defend us against this uh, virus, uh, engage, uh, virus bombardment. And uh, there are certain pattern recognition receptors that are resident in cells or cell-associated. And these pattern recognition receptors can uh, sense pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And uh, this system would then give rise to an antiviral cascade that leads to accumulation of cytokines and uh, um, co-stimulatory molecules. And this would, uh, in um, total, give rise to an antiviral immune response, which uh, culminates in expression of antiviral proteins. And these antiviral proteins can then basically defend against uh, incoming viruses. Now, uh, since most viruses have co-evolved with uh, humans, um, there, um, and all viruses that are uh, successfully infecting us um, somehow manage to, to inhibit the system, uh, it appears that most viruses somehow manipulate either induction of type 1 interferon or the activity of antiviral pro proteins. And only if viruses can do that, they would be pathogenic in uh, mammalian systems. And one example is shown here. So this is an uh, orthomyxovirus that is called Dogotovirus, very similar to influenza virus. And in a wild type version, this uh, virus does only induce minuscule amounts of type 1 interferon in an infected mouse model. But, uh, and this virus is highly pathogenic, as you can see here. But uh, if this virus is mutated in a single amino acid uh, on, a, um, on a, a segment six of this virus, this virus would give uh, high rise to high amounts of type 1 interferon in vivo. And uh, these mice are completely protected. So uh, clearly showing that this manipulation step of viruses is a very essential part of uh, virus pathogenicity. And uh, the, in the pathogenicity of a virus in general is dictated by molecular interactions that are happening either uh, um, between the viral RNA or, or viral structures and pattern recognition receptors, uh, between uh, antiviral proteins and viruses, but or, and also between uh, um, viral open reading frames of viruses uh, that somehow manipulate the system. And uh, today I will mo mostly focus on um, the recognition of viruses and also uh, on one antiviral defense system that evolved to uh, detect a very characteristic viral RNA. And uh, both of these uh, systems are basically linked uh, through the engagement of double-stranded RNA uh, or viral nucleic acid. Uh, so uh, double-stranded RNA has been um, um, considered as a stimulus of the antiviral defense system for very long. This started in the 1970s. And uh, it is now commonly accepted that double-stranded RNA can activate a interferon induction through a canonical pathway that involves uh, activation of RIC-like receptors and uh, transcription factors. And this type 1 interferon would then give rise to these uh, antiviral proteins that are uh, basically um, inactive in cells. And the activity of these antiviral proteins would also require engagement of a very similar um, viral nucleic acid. And only if they can engage this viral nucleic acid, they will uh, expose their detrimental um, activities, detrimental not only for the virus, but also uh, detrimental to the cells themselves. So in some way, this seems to be a, a safety mechanism to only uh, activate these proteins in the presence of a virus. Um, so if you look at virally infected cells and, for instance, stain for the presence of double-stranded RNA by uh, antibodies, you would find that uh, viruses are actually very diverse in their ability to generate these double-stranded RNAs. There are some picona viruses that generate vast amounts of this double-stranded RNA in the uh, cytoplasm. There's a, this is a semiliki forest virus, a flabby virus that does the same. 
Rio virus and Vaccinia virus, which is actually a DNA virus, also generate double-stranded RNAs, but there are some viruses that seem not to generate large amounts of double-stranded RNA, and these are, for instance, orthomyxovirus viruses like influenza virus, and also Bunia viruses like uh, Rift Valley fever virus. And uh, we asked uh, wh how come that these viruses are actually uh, stimulating type 1 interferon, and um, a couple of years back now, we identified that is, it is actually the virus genomic RNA that can stimulate type 1 interferon. So if you would, for instance, isolate genomic RNA of virus particles and transfect that into cells, you get a high induction of type 1 interferon. And uh, this was true for a negative strand RNA virus, is co virus called vesicular stomatitis virus and influenza virus. And uh, this virus RNA was very special because it normally bears a 5 prime G-phosphate that is a remnant of uh, the virus polymerase. And if you cut off this 5 prime G-phosphate, the interferon induction is completely planted uh, simply by uh, dephosphorylating the RNA with carfentestinal phosphatase. So we could show that this uh, activation is going through a, a pattern recognition receptor called weak I, and this would activate the canonically signaling pathway. And uh, altogether, it seems that there is a number of different pathways in the cell that uh, all would lead to type 1 interferon induction, but it would require a different set of uh, pattern recognition receptors that are somehow linked to, a different, to different types of substrates. So there's long double-stranded RNA that can activate a pattern recognition receptor MDA5, 5 prime triphosphorylated RNA that would activate weak I, and more recently there were some uh, sensors of DNA that can um, um, activate downstream signaling, either uh, through directly engaging uh, IRF3 or through um, generating a second messenger mo molecule that would activate a, a protein called um, Sting. Now, um, since we now found that uh, there was 5 prime triphosphorylated RNA uh, activating rig I, we wondered whether there would also be an, a set of antiviral proteins that is present in cells and would also engage, engage the same type of RNA. So basically, we were looking for a protein or for proteins that were uh, induced by type 1 interference and uh, would then have a direct antiviral activity and inhibit virus growth. And in order to, under, to identify such proteins, we used a proteomic approach whereby we basically fused uh, 5 prime triphosphorylated RNA to beads or we def and dephosphorylated the same type of RNA on beads and uh, precipitated lysates from uh, cells that were treated with type 1 interferon or not and uh, analyzed uh, the amount of or the number of proteins that were basically binding to these different types of baits. Uh, and uh, in essence, what we identified uh, looks like that. So here in this uh, so-called volcano plot, you can see the forward enrichment on the x-axis and uh, the, the p-value of enrichment on the y-axis. So every protein that would be enriched in a, in a certain condition would be in the top left or top right corner. And if you compare these two conditions, 5 prime OH RNA and 5 prime PPP RNA, you would see that there is an entire family of proteins that would be highly enriched in uh, PPP RNA precipitates as compared to 5 prime hydroxylated um, RNA. And uh, these proteins are actually called interferon-induced proteins with tetratricobeptide repeats. And at the time we identified them, these proteins were uh, barely studied. But uh, what was known at that time already was that these are highly interference-stimulated proteins. As you can see here, these are mice that are infected with an interference-stimulating agent. Well, no, these are livers of mice, I should say. Uh, infected with an interference-stimulating agent, and here shown in, in green. And in the vicinity or in the air in, of this infection event, you can see uh, IFID protein production going up, clearly showing that IFID proteins are very sensitive and uh, highly induced proteins. Now, in uh, humans, there are four different IFIDs, IFID 1, 2, 3, and 5, and we basically could identify all of these IFIDs in these uh, precipitates. And in mice, there are only three IFIDs, IFID 1, 2, and uh, 3. And uh, we wanted to confirm this data basically by uh, co-precipitation experiments. So we overexpressed renilidect IFID proteins. And very much to our surprise, we could not recapitulate that mass spec data uh, entirely because we could see that IFID 1 would bind to these, to these beads and IFID 5 would bind to these beads. But IFID 2 and 3 are basically not binding to 5 prime PPP RNA beads 
in this uh, René Le Bourdon essays. So we were a bit um, surprised by that, and we started to uh, uh, envisage different hypotheses why this could be the case. And uh, to cut the long story short, we basically uh, did a um, mass spec approach whereby we expressed different IFID proteins in hex cells, treated these cells with type 1 interferon, and did tandem affinity purification. And altogether, we found that these IFID proteins are actually forming a very tight complex consisting of IFID 1, 2, and 3. And this complex engages uh, additional proteins. And, but in this complex, there's only one IFID protein that uh, can directly bind to PPP RNA. And only in the presence of type 1 interferon, you would get uh, formation of this complex. And the enter and PPP RNA would basically precipitate IFID 1, 2, and 3. That's why we identified this complex in, uh, by mass spec, but individual proteins would, uh, only individual IFID1 would bind to PPP RNA. So uh, we tested whether this has any effect on, um, in an infectious setting, so we used two different viruses. One is a vesicular stomatitis virus that generates 5' PPP RNA, or uh, encephalomyocarditis virus that does not generate PPP RNA. And we knocked down these different IFIDs in cells, and if you knock down IFID1, or two or three, you could see that compared to the control knockdown, this virus was growing much better. And uh, this difference in, uh, in virus growth uh, was not apparent for encephalomyocarditis virus, suggesting that there's indeed uh, some specificity for a virus that generates 5 prime PPP RNA. And uh, we could also confirm that this is hap this, the same happens in vivo by uh, knocking out IFID1 in mice and again, if you infected these mice with vesicular stomatitis virus, they were much more susceptible to VSV as compared to uh, control mice. And for the control virus used here, we could not see this difference, clearly suggesting that IV proteins have an antiviral activity against viruses that generate PPP RNA. So altogether, we think that um, there is two different IV sensors in the cell. One is that there is a rig eye sensing of PPP RNA to induce type 1 interferon. And uh, there is an IFID1, uh, IFID1 to 3 complex that binds to uh, PPP RNA. And IFID5 would also bind to PPP RNA, but this actually does not require formation of a complex. A question that, of course, uh, that we were wondering about uh, was uh, how do IFIDs really detect PPP RNA? And uh, the reason why this was uh, intriguing is that uh, IFIDs are actually. Uh, very boring proteins because they, don't, they only have to consist of one domain, which are tetratricopeptide repeats. So there are a typical IFID, there is a number of IFIDs listed, uh, or domains of IFIDs listed here. A typical IFID has about 10 tetratricopeptide repeats, uh, one lined up after the other. There is no DNA binding domain or any other domain that would suggest how IFIDs are really binding to RNA. And uh, so normally, what this, this tetratricopeptide repeats are two antiparallel alpha helices, so they would form an alpha helix, a little linker, and a second alpha helix, so that would basically form a curl uh, that is linked up like this. And if you have a number of uh, tetratricopeptide repeats uh, lined up after each other, you would get a superhelix formation that is known from uh, other proteins that are containing many tetratricopeptide repeats, such as topoisomer erase 5 or oglucnac transferases. So all these proteins form uh, a superhelix. Now we teamed up with uh, Bushan Nagar and Yasun Abbas at uh, McGill University. They are uh, crystallographers, and they solved the crystal structure of IFID5, which uh, was very shocking to us in the very beginning because the crystal structure did not at all look like a superhelix. Uh, instead, this protein appears to have three different subdomains. Here, a subdomain 1 in yellow, subdomain 2 in green, and subdomain uh, 3 here in blue. And uh, if you turn this protein a little bit, you can see that uh, the protein is forming a clamp-like structure um, with a little tunnel or a cavity on the bottom of this protein shown here. Um, this uh, superhelical structure that we expected is basically broken by the, this tetratricopeptide repeat here and by a pivot structure there. So uh, basically, all that IFITs are forming is a sort of clamp-like structure. 
And if you do a surface charge prediction, you would find that this basic uh, bottom cavity here is uh, highly charged. And uh, Yasun was uh, fortunate to co-crystallize IFIT5 with PPP RNA, and it seemed to slot exactly in this cavity on the bottom of the protein. Now, uh, this binding of uh, PPP RNA results in a conformational change of IFIT5, so it, there is a 17 degrees um, swap of the C terminus. And if you look in detail how this binding is happening, you would find that uh, there are amino acids coming from all different types, sides of uh, this IFIT protein. So it's coming from subdomain 1 here in yellow, binding to the 5 prime gamma and the beta phosphate. Uh, it, there are amino acid residues coming from subdomain 2, binding to exactly the same amino acid residues. There is a stabilizing ion here, and here you can see the first base of the, of the 5 prime 3 phosphorylated RNA. And if you go down now the, uh, the RNA strand, so this would be the backbone of the RNA, you would see that the nucleotides themselves are quite freely in this cavity, but uh, the backbone, again, is bound by additional residues in subdomain 2, and there is a phenylalanine in subdomain 3 that is stacking the first two bases of the RNA. And uh, after that, uh, basically, the RNA protrudes out of this cavity, and, uh, and it is basically not uh, diffracting anymore. So you can see that the RNA, the RNA is slotting into this very narrow tunnel here, and uh, this uh, binding seems to be independent of the nucleotide base because it can bind purine and pyrimidine bases. There is sufficient space for both these uh, nucleotides. And uh, if you look, uh, but what it can, it can only bind the single-stranded RNA, and this is even better visible in a cross-section of the protein because it is basically a very, very narrow tunnel that only allows binding of a single-stranded RNA. So, um, and this could be confirmed by um, biochemical experiments. So IFIT5 would, for instance, shift a single-stranded RNA probe that is 5 prime 3 phosphorylated, so this is recombinant IFIT5 added to the probe, and you would see a shift of this probe to a higher molecular weight of, um, structure. And uh, if you use double-stranded RNA that is, that is containing a fully blunted double-stranded RNA, IFIT5 is not able to shift this RNA. But if there is only a three nucleotide overhang on the 5 prime end, IFIT5 would again shift this RNA, suggesting that IFITs are bona fide single-stranded RNA um, recognition sensors. And uh, the 5' prime uh, modification is quite important because if you would have only a monophosphate instead of a 3-phosphate, uh, this RNA would not, sh uh, would not be shifted by IFIT5, as shown here, or if there would be a M7 GT peak um, protein on, uh, nucleotide on the 5' prime end that is basically mimicking a, a cellular mRNA, IFIT5 would also not be able to shift this probe. Um, so these residues that we identified in the structures all seem to be important for binding, uh, more or less. There are some exceptions to that. But uh, if you mutated these residues that we identified in the structure, we lost binding of uh, IFIT5 to PPP RNA. Um, and these are the residues in the, that would bind the gamma phosphate and beta phosphate, or also the residues that would bind the backbone. So it seems that all these different residues that are coming from different sides of the protein are somehow contributing to the binding of IFIT5. And uh, if you now look at antiviral activities of IFIT5, you can see that the wild-type protein would inhibit growth of uh, vesicular stomatitis virus um, or GFP expression of a GFP expressing VSV uh, variant. And uh, if you overexpressed uh, mutated versions that have, do not have the ability to bind to PPP RNA anymore, this antiviral activity is lost. So clearly, the ability to bind to the RNA and, uh, is somehow maybe, um, important for antiviral activity. So, uh, there, are, so there were two proteins that were binding to 5' prime PPP RNA, as I showed in the beginning. This was IFIT5 and IFIT1. And, if you, and you can, can see that uh, the residues that we identified in the structure of IFIT1 seem to be largely um, uh, conserved in IFIT1, suggesting that these two proteins would indeed uh, form uh, or use a, different, a similar uh, binding mechanism. And uh, it's not only conserved in the two human IFITs, but also in the Muran version of IFIT1. 
Whereas all the other IFITs that do not bind to PPP RNA uh, have mutations that are basically perturbing the binding of IFIT1 or of IFITs to PPP RNA. So, um, so IFIT5 form, IFIT forms a, a very complex structure to bind the, the, this uh, PPP RNA. And this PPP RNA needs to be single stranded. And uh, we think that uh, uh, this very complex arrangement of tetratricopeptide repeats may be a feature that is sometimes found in, in a community, whereby, for instance, the uh, Lewisian reach repeats in TLRs are forming a similar uh, repetitive element that uh, can be used to detect different um, structures that are associated to pathogens. Um, so we now know roughly how, or we know how PPP RNA is binding to IFIT5, and we, uh, can, we have models of IFIT1 that would suggest that it is a very similar binding mechanism. Uh, a question is, of course, uh, how, what is the mechanism of IFIT1 or IFIT activity? And uh, so um, the, in a few years ago, there was a paper by Michael Diamond's lab that was, uh, I think, uh, groundbreaking in this field. And this was that he showed that viruses that do not methylate the RNA at the 2 prime opposition of the first nucleotide are inhibited by IFIT proteins. And uh, basically, we, we catched up on that and thought that it could be a mechanism or a, a tool that allows us to study the IFIT complex in more detail. So um, the methylation I'm talking about is basically um, something that is very inherent to our messenger RNA. So messenger RNA, in principle, has a guanine cap that is shown up here. And uh, these are the first bases or the, the polynucleotide strand continuing to the ground here. And uh, this cap is uh, linked by a 3-phosphate group. And an important feature of the mRNA is that this mRNA is methylated at different sites. So the most important and most well-known site is the N7 methylation that is basically important for uh, binding of many cellular translation factors or cellular factors are also involved in uh, mRNA uh, transport. And so this methylation site is important to uh, increase affinity to these to this factors. But in addition to this N7 methylation, there are also methylation sites at the 2 prime opposition of the first ribose and the 2 prime opposition of the second ribose. And there is a, in, in vertebrates, there is a dedicated uh, enzyme that would convert all mRNA in 2 prime O methylated uh, mRNA. And most viruses mimic this uh, type of um, methylation, so there seems to be that uh, flabby viruses and uh, other and DNA viruses like vaccinia and box viruses are basically also uh, encoding for their own 2 prime O methyl transferase. Other viruses are basically stealing the mRNA 5 prime end of cellular mRNA and uh, by doing so also steal the 2 prime O methylation. Um, but uh, there are some viruses around that do not have this 2 prime O methylation that are basically uh, variants or mutants, mutated viruses. And these viruses appear to be inhibited by IFID proteins in a mouse model. And uh, Forcatil showed that uh, RNA that is not methylated at the 2 prime O position uh, may activate a pattern recognition receptor MDA5. So we got interested in this uh, unmethylated RNA because we thought that this could be an, a, a handle as to further understand the IFID proteins. So we basically did similar experiments as shown before. So we fused unmethylated RNA, uh, cu capped RNA to beads and uh, asked whether there, which proteins would be binding to this type of RNA. And we could find that indeed the IFID123 complex was well, could be identified in this uh, mass spec experiments. And this was quite uh, intriguing because we could find IFID1, 2, and 3. But this, in this case, we could not identify IFID5 which was a bit surprising to us because so far all we could see is that IFID5 was very similar to IFID1. Um, so, we, uh, confirmed, so we confirmed direct binding of IFID proteins to these beads by uh, using recombinant IFID proteins. And again, uh, interestingly, the only protein that would bind to IFID, uh, would bind to this unmethylated capped RNA is IFID1, whereas the other IFID proteins do not bind to this capped RNA. And again, we think that these IFID proteins are forming a complex, and IFID1 would be a nucleic acid sensor. 
Uh, so that suggests that IFID1 has two affinities. It can bind to, to PPP RNA and to cupped RNA. And IFID5 basically can only bind to PPP RNA, but not to cupped RNA, suggesting that there is additional complexity involved between the binding of these two proteins. Um, now, uh, I, I just, if you now ask whether there are proteins that would bind better to unmethylated and cupped uh, and uh, fully methylated RNA, we used two different uh, type of methyla methylated RNA and asked for uh, increased enrichment in either the, uh, the fully methylated RNA or the unmethylated RNA. And the only proteins that we could find to really bind better to unmethylated RNA was basically the IFID123 complex and uh, the cellular 2'O methyl transferase, whereas all the other cellular proteins appear to have higher affinity for the fully methylated cupped RNA. Um, and we could also confirm that by Western plotting. So here, for instance, you can see that the full methylation of the cup structure would impair binding of IFID1 to, to do this uh, RNA bait. Whereas uh, if this RNA is unmethylated at the 2 prime O position or any other position, or if you used 5 prime PVP RNA, we can uh, see nice uh, precipitation of IFID1. Whereas a cellular cup binding protein, ERF4E, would bind better in the, uh, if the RNA is fully methylated. And the same is true if you use a fully synthetic RNA um, that is a 20 mer oligonucleotide. Uh, here again, if this oligonucleotide is fully methylated, uh, we, we do not see binding of IFID1 anymore. So we turn to, a, uh, in, to an infection model to, to further study this. And we uh, got a Muran hepatitis virus, which is a coronavirus that is, uh, has been engineered by for, for Cartil. And this virus comes in two different flavors. So one, uh, the wild type virus, generates uh, RNA that is very much like cellular mRNA. It's fully methylated. And we also use the mutant virus that has a, a mutation, a single point mutation, in the non-structural protein 16, which is the 2 prime O methyl transferase. And this virus generates unmethylated RNA. And if you now infect uh, bone marrow cells from wild type, or from IFID1 deficient cells, you can see that the mutant virus is severely impaired in growth in, this, uh, in wild type cells, and this impairment is fully recovered uh, if you use IFID1 knockout cells, which is basically recapitulating what uh, Michael Diamond had been showing before. And also, if we infect these mice with uh, these two different viruses, you can see that uh, in wild type mice, the mutant virus is completely uh, blocked from replication, and in IFID1 deficient in livers of IFID1 deficient mice, this virus can still grow at least to detectable levels. So we thought that uh, this model system may be a, a system that can help us to, to further understand the activity of the IFID uh, proteins. And uh, so th there could be a variety of scenarios where IFID proteins can be active. And uh, for that, we have to consider what the RNA cap is uh, responsible for in the cell. So normally the cup RNA is uh, important for the export of mRNA, but we, we think that uh, IFID proteins do not play a major role there because uh, the Muran hepatitis virus is cytoplasmic and uh, IFID1 protein is also a cytoplasmic protein. So we tested whether uh, the RNA stability is impaired in uh, IFID1 deficient or IFID1 sufficient cells. And this is a quite complicated uh, um, experiment, but what it shows is basically that we infected cells with uh, um, these two different viruses, and then blocked virus application and monitored whether a mon monitored um, accumulation of viral RNA. And we had to basically block uh, virus application by using cyclohexamide since there are no um, inhibitors of virus growth around. So, but what you can see here in this uh, dashed line is that uh, if the virus has no ability to grow any further, there is uh, no difference in mRNA stability or viral RNA stability, suggesting that the IFID proteins are not really um, affecting RNA stability. Um, so lastly, we tested whether there may be an uh, effect on the translation efficiency of uh, cupped and uncupped RNA. And to do that, we again used the um, mass spectrometry approach that is called poor Silec um, LCMSMS approach. In a sense, this is very similar to an, uh, a commonly used S35 labeling, whereby uh, a radioactively labeled amino acid is spiked into a, 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 pro, into a 
uh, tissue culture um, uh, vessel. And uh, this radioactively labeled uh, amino acids are normally incorporated. In, and after uh, an incubation time, you can basically measure how much uh, radioactive labor is incorporated in newly synthesized proteins. In our case, we did not use radioactivity, but we used heavy labeled amino acids that can be detected by mass spectrometry. So uh, basically, we used uh, two different cell lines, again, wild type and IFID1 deficient cells, and infected them with uh, muran hepatitis virus. And after a certain period of time, we basically burst these cells for two hours with uh, uh, this heavy labeled amino acid. And then you can, can measure the heavy to light ratio of all proteins that are basically newly synthesized in the cells in this given burst period. And now if you do, if you do that, we could uh, identify 730 cellular proteins. And uh, all the cellular proteins appear to have very similar translation rates, regardless of whether this uh, was experiment was done in wild type or IFID1 deficient systems, or whether these cells were infected with wild type or a mutant virus. But when we looked at viral proteins, we could see that there was a selective impairment of translation for viral proteins in the wild type situation. And there was no impairment in, if, we, if IFID1 deficient systems were used, suggesting that IFID1 has a very selective effect on virus protein production, and uh, that cellular proteins are basically not affected by the presence of IFID proteins. Um, so we could also uh, uh, show that, uh, confirm that in vitro. So we used uh, recombinant IFID protein and measured translation rates of renilla RNA that had different 5' modifications. And uh, unmethylated or only and 7-methylated RNAs were inhibited by the addition of IFID proteins, whereas uh, fully methylated RNA uh, was uh, um, translating uh, normally, basically, suggesting that uh, IFID proteins are directly binding to 5' um, unmethylated RNA and inhibit its activity in vitro. Uh, we could show that this is a stoichiometric effect because if we now uh, increase the amount of capped RNA template, we could alleviate the effect of IFID1, suggesting that there's a stoichiometric interaction between the IFID protein and uh, the RNA template. Um, so we think that uh, basically the IFID protein um, is somehow inhibiting viral uh, translation of unmethylated RNA. And translation normally re requires the engagement of translation factors on the 5 end of the, of the RNA. And uh, the translation factor that is mostly, uh, that needs to engage first is uh, ERF4E, the eukaryotic initiation factor for E. And it directly binds to the 5 prime cup RNA. Now, when we used, uh, we used uh, recombinant proteins to see whether IFID1 would have the ability to uh, displays ERF4E from this capped, unmethylated capped RNA. And to do that, we, so we precipitated unmethylated capped RNA, uh, as used unmethylated capped RNA spade, and precipitated ERF4E. And when we spiked in IFID1, we could see that ERF4E, uh, there was less ERF4E recovered from these beads. But when we used fully methylated uh, RNA, there was uh, the recovery of ERF4E was similar in the presence or in the absence of IFID1, suggesting that uh, what IFID1 is doing is to not allow the engagement of the pre-initiation complex on this uh, unmethylated RNA. And we could show that something very similar may be happening in vivo. These are MEFs from uh, IFID1 sufficient and deficient cells. And again, in the unmethylated capped RNA-IP, you see much more EIFOE precipitated from knockout cells as compared to wild type cells, and this difference again was not seen if we uh, used the fully methylated capped RNA, suggesting that IFID1 competes with binding for ERF4E to RNA. So uh, we think that uh, in case of a 2' prime unmethylated viral RNA, there is uh, IFID1 binding to the 5' prime end of uh, the RNA, and uh, this uh, engagement of RNA and by IFID1 does not allow ERF4E to um, initiate trans translation, whereas in the, abs in the presence of a methylation mark at the 2' O position, uh, IFID1 cannot bind well to this RNA, and ERF4E would bind better, and this would then allow initiation of a, a translation complex, 
and, uh, and synthesis of a polypeptide strand. Uh, so we think that IFID proteins are basically steric in the in the actors of our hindrance, they somehow inhibit virus replication by steric hindrance. They may, in case of uh, unmethylated capped RNA, inhibit um, uh, initiation of translation or any other function such as uh, assembly of virus protein particles. In case of PPP RNA, we, are, we don't know whether it, uh, what it is doing exactly, but we think that it may be a very similar mechanism in the sense that uh, IFID1 may bind to PPP RNA, and that would somehow impair either trafficking or assembly of a viral protein, and uh, of a viral um, uh, baryon. And uh, we think that this is uh, happening through a, a stoichiometric interaction of IFID proteins with these baits. Uh, I should mention that there was a, a paper by uh, Tatiana Beskova's lab, who at exactly the same time came to exactly the same conclusion. Uh, so we think that, this, that the model we proposed here is uh, maybe true. Now, uh, one question that I want to touch only briefly and lastly on is, uh, why do IFID proteins really need to bind to each other? So we very prominently saw that there is a complex forming between IFID 1, 2, and 3. And uh, also we, this is a very, very um, um, prominent uh, phenotype we really don't know exactly why this is the case. So we started to, uh, to study that, and we turned to a system that is not very commonly used in uh, innate immunity, and that is yeast. And the reason why yeast is uh, such a perfect model to study that is that lower eukaryotes do not normally methylate their RNA at the 2'0 position. This 2'0 methylation only started from the transition from invertebrates to vertebrates, and yeast, therefore, do not have a 2 prime methylation. So, this, uh, so we expressed IFID proteins in yeast and basically uh, induced it by uh, uh, beta-galactosidase induction. And uh, all we did was to see how yeast would be growing in the presence of IFID proteins. So we can express IFID-1 and IFID-3, just as shown here in this, in this yeast. And uh, very much to our disappointment, actually, we found that uh, if we express IFID-1 or IFID-3, Yeast is growing just perfectly well and uh, to similar kinetics as uh, an empty vector control. So we started to uh, use combinations of uh, IFID proteins, namely IFID1 and IFID3 together, and very surprisingly to us, it seems that the uh, presence of both proteins, IFID1 and IFID3, completely impairs yeast growth, and suggesting that uh, IFID1 somehow binds to the RNA, but I and IFID3 is somehow uh, required for the uh, antiviral function or for the biological activity of IFID1. Now, if you add a viral 2 prime O methyl transferase from a vaccinia virus that is called VP39, you can some, uh, to some extent restore growth of yeast, suggesting that this enter the uh, system indeed requires a 2 prime O methyl transfer, uh, unmethylated RNA. And uh, it also requires the combination of different IFID proteins. So IFIDs somehow need to cooperate to be fully active. And we think that, well, we now know that uh, the affinity of IFID1 would uh, be affected by the presence of IFID3. And also that uh, IFID1 is sort of multimerizing. And this multimerization also requires IFID3. So it could be that uh, IFID1 is a sensor, and IFID3 is sort of the glue between the sensors. And this would uh, then be a model that allows to uh, basically uh, inhibit uh, virus uh, RNA activity in cells. So altogether, we think that the IFID system is a very central antiviral system in cells. It can have different activities. It may well be that there are other uh, nucleic acids bound by the IFID system. We think that all it is doing is a steric hindrance and uh, inhibition of, uh, of uh, RNA biology coming from viruses or coming from, uh, well, uh, other uh, nucleic sensed proteins. Uh, and we think that altogether this uh, system is very much like, we, like a headlock system, whereby the IFID protein itself is very free in the cell because otherwise it would not be able to engage the RNA. And only if it engages the RNA, the IFID proteins would close in on the five prime end of the RNA and um, this would then basically 
uh, allow the um, formation of this complex and uh, is, uh, is required. So it's very much reminiscent of some um, uh, battles of humans and battles between viruses and hosts. So finally, I want to uh, thank people who were involved, uh, mostly uh, Matthias Habian and Philipp Huber, who have been working a lot on IFID proteins. Bear is uh, working on uh, yeast proteins. And uh, we are enjoying a nice environment in Matthias Mann's department. And we have uh, really important collaborators, like uh, Julio Subertifurge in Vienna and Bushan Nagar for structural biology, uh, Forker in, for uh, in vivo models of virus infections, uh, Shark is a bioinformatician. And uh, we have some long-standing uh, collaborations with Friedemann Weber and Georg Kochs from Freiburg and Marburg. And I also want to acknowledge uh, our funding sources and uh, you for your attention.